Welcome back to Tetracan Super Monoblock. Uh, this video or set of videos, I'm not sure how many videos I'm making about this yet, but uh, it's focusing on the Sphostix X28H. Haven't tested it yet. I will document any repairs I do on it eventually, but uh, this video is just going to be showing you how to take it apart and access all the parts. So whether you need to change belts, give the thing a clean, access the different printed circuit boards for soldering, then here is your reconnaissance. Since we're going to be removing the mixer from the plastic case later on, then I'm going to get off all the plastic knobs from the front that I can. Usually um, rotary knobs on Fostex, well the majority of the Fostex I've opened so far, then they're mounted from the back, I uh, can't pull them off from the front because the plastic case is in the way, that seems to be the case with all of these ones. But you can see that already three of these switch caps have come off, they're missing. That means these ones must come off. So, just using some sort of plastic implement to get them off without scratching the case. Yep, yeah, these um, feeder knobs are going to come off. I already removed the screws from the back. You make sure when you turn that over you're on a soft surface so you don't scratch the case or anything. Um, but we've got one, two, three holes that had a short or screw, maybe three centimeters long wide ferrule going into a plastic mounting post. The white ones correspond to these longer ones that have got a smooth shank. Same ferrule, same medium size crosshead screwdriver, you're gonna to need to take them out. Um, I will just take the uh, pitch control cap off just now in case that makes any difference. Everything's attached to the bottom. Oh dear, that's just snapped. Right, so the, the only thing really keeping these two parts attached was that this soldered in common ground wire, which is going into a socket there, was attached to this bit of shielding. The little black clips that sit on plastic posts. Um, you can usually pry them up with a screwdriver. And yeah, do be a little bit careful because I just broke the plastic post. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. That's not actually a design feature about Vostexes that I like very much. A little bit hard to take off, a little bit easy to break. Get another one of these up without breaking it. Oh man, that's really firmly held in. I'm trying to think which model it was. Um, maybe a 4628 you've probably seen me successfully get some of these up. I'll leave it up to you whether you remove those. Um... <laughs> That's my cat. Come here. Come here. Come and be in the video. Come here. I wanted to see if you wanted to be in the video, but you didn't. Right, where was I before I got distracted by my feline friend? Um, do you leave that in? move on I think. So yeah I haven't seen many where they're all attached to the bottom like this so slightly hesitant about what to do next. I think I'll just take these knobs off they're gonna to need to be cleaned later on aren't they? You can see the common ground wire from this bit of shielding is going up to the top left corner of the transport there. So what I will say about that design is it makes it very easy to clean the mixer. Um, normally you'd have to disassemble it a lot more in order to be able to get in here with contact cleaner, compressed air, lubricant. Um, check my channel for more detailed videos about how to clean a mixer. So apart from cleaning the mixer, then the, the other common thing you're maybe going to need to do is change the belts on the transport. So let's focus on trying to get the transport separate. Looks like we need to get this LCD display screen and transport button gubbins out of the way. So I'm kind of guessing about which screws are necessary to be removed, but I'm going to go for these two at the side and we'll see what happens. Centimeter and a half wide ferrule black screws coming out of there. There's two screws on this side, sort of double cap brass looking guys. Yeah, they're about the same length as, as the black ones were, just a slightly different style. Okay, so this little button 
comes up separately on a rubbing controller. And we've got a, a whole array that comes out like that. Um, so you can see some of the wires of the transport connected back here. Um, yeah, you can just pull that out by the strength of the wires. And just sort of leave that dangling out like that. This plate here is going to obstruct that motor which is located down here. That's your typical centimetre and a bit brassish looking wide ferrule internal screw that I would find in a lot of motley trackers. There's a screw up here as well. In fact, there's a third one here. Alright, so shielding chassis guy like that angled lip. That's to allow for the, the belt. In fact, this header here in the bottom of this, that's also related to the motor. So we can detach that. Yeah, easy access to the mixer by the looks of it. Unusually difficult access to the transport because, of course, the magnetic heads are going to be attached to the record and playback PCB. And it looks like we've got to remove the mixer in order to get to that. So these holes up here that have got white round them in the PCB, they're through holes for the screws from the rear plastic case to come through. So it's possibly just this screw in the bottom left that's holding that down. Apart from obviously the sandwiching force of the two halves of the plastic case. Okay, yeah, yeah, so that is loose. Um, but we are going to need to detach the cable. So we've got... You get my terminology sorted out. Plugs, connectors, that's pretty much the same thing, pretty much synonyms. And um, header and socket, that's pretty much the same thing, pretty much synonyms. So you can see that the colour of the plug doesn't match the socket, the colour of the uh, connector doesn't match the header. However, one of the cables on the wire does match. So here we've got a little red header and there's a red wire on the plug. Um, similarly, there's a yellow header Sorry, white header with a white wire on the plug. So that'll help you in reassembly. And it looks like we've got four of these to detach over here. These wires look thick enough that I feel confident to just use the strength of the wire to detach them. So at that point, that's going to tip forward. And we've got ribbon wires soldered directly into the board. So that's just going to have to dangle like so. Under here, there's a bit of shielding. And that's going back on the ground wire to the top left corner of this one um, but we do at least at that point have enough access to get the magnetic heads detached. Brown cables are going to the record and playback head that's the one on the right, uh, the one on the left, the black one that's the erase head um, but they're joining together into four connectors per channel so we've got a green one here I'm going to use pliers just because these cables are a little bit delicate. They're actually labelled in the PCP so we've got tracks 4, 3, 2, 1 um, it's written white right in there track 4. You know you could also use a flathead screwdriver get under the plastic lip of the connector just as long as you don't put stress on the cables themselves okay so that's the magnetic heads detached from the cord playback boards so at this point we can focus on getting this transport out and looking at the bits looks like these two holes are through holes for the case so for, from the front we're only removing two screws notice that in this bottom right corner got this little double earth connector so I probably have to refer to my own footage presumably that was attaching to this bit down here in any case for the purposes of reassembly I don't want to remind myself about that so I'm going to put DE and remember that there's something special to go back in that hole in this corner we've got common ground connector going to the mixer shielding uh, once I get this screw out then I'll write MS earth for mixer shielding on it I mean, you can probably devise a better acronym than that. I just mean, leave some sort of notes to yourself in reconstruction that make your job easier. Uh, notice as well that there's another common earth cable in this big kind of bundle of cables that's going to that corner. One more screw down here by the motor. I'm left out now. Okay. So, uh, not the easiest removal of a um, transport that I've ever seen. Parts of this look quite similar to 424 Mark II and III transport. I mean, obviously the motor is located in a completely different place. But uh, I would assume that was probably the same third party manufacturer and there's a, 
high degree of compatibility in the parts. You can see it's a single motor system. What motor is that? Oh, my Pucci. No. Well, it's a high speed one anyway. Um, because it says high speed in front of the unit. You can see that there's a little pulley on the underside of that motor, which is driving this belt. And that's going to the real mechanism there. Got solenoids, which will be controlling shift arms. We'll see it clearly in a minute when I take off the belt, but there's a little um, set of teeth on the bottom of this flywheel as well, depending on what the shift arms are doing, according to what the solenoids are doing, according to what the buttons, user presses and control board is doing, then that little set of teeth may or may not turn a bunch of gears here and those gears are raising and lowering the heads. So, you know, bearing in mind there's basically three things that any one of these transports does. When this raises, the tape is caught between this spinning pin called the capstan and uh, this rubber wheel called the pinch roller and that causes the tape to move across the heads at a steady speed in playback. In fast forward and play, this reel, take up reel, will turn in this direction. That's driven by uh, a reel mechanism, something in here that makes these turn. And in rewind, it's the opposite. This one turns that way to rewind the tape. So this moving up and down, function one, capstan turning, function two, something to control the rotation of both of these reels, that's function three. All three of them have been driven by one motor via this belt to this flywheel, and from there the flywheel is turning a secondary, smaller belt, which turning that wheel for the reels and turning cogs for the raising and lowering of the heads. Uh, so I hope that's a little bit of background that can help you troubleshoot what's going on with this if you have a faulty one. I mean, you're going to have to remove this plate if you're going to need to change this belt. Actually, that belt feels fine. I'll have a pause, have a drink of coffee and come back and take this off. Okay, I'm back. I'm caffeinated. I think we're going to have to remove both screws from both sides. I mean, I seem to remember that. Actually, that's how it worked in the 424 transport, wasn't it? 424 Mark 2 and 3. So the only difference between the screws seems to be that uh, the one with a washer is the higher of the pair and the smooth one is the one that goes through the black clip. And uh, that's going to be the same on this side. See this one that's going directly into the metal has a little washer and, and you know you can see there's a lot of lint and dirt in there so we'll definitely be able to get in there with some compressed air and give this a, a bit of a clean. Clean those heads with isopropyl. Uh, yeah, so that's just those four screws holding this plate on. I guess when we replace this belt, then leave that hanging off to the side. Oh, it's a little bit of focus here where I'm pointing. Little pins that will go into holes down at the bottom of that chassis with these two lips inside the lips on this part of the chassis. And then you would having first ensured that the belt is still around the flywheel put that around there and replace the screws you know my setup is i've got this kind of camera sitting between me and what i'm looking at so it's a little bit awkward for me so i'm going to go and do that off screen but i think that's enough information for you to be able to do that yourself um oh i said i was going to look at the flywheel anyway didn't i so um, yeah you can see the other belt that's driving the reel system if i take this flywheel out you need to be careful because usually yeah, you see there's a little plastic washer that stops start getting into that recess. As long as I set that aside, then I can uh, lift this flywheel out, out. And you can see there's a pulley going from this belt, turning this wheel, and that's your wheel mechanism. And then here's the teeth that, depending on the mode that it's in, interact with all these gears. Here's your shift arms attached to solenoids. That's what's responding to the transport controls. And so all this gubbins will be to do with raising and lowering the magnetic heads in the pinch roller. I should probably tell you about the belt sizes, eh? Um, so that larger flat capstan belt is about 4mm in width and the folded length is around 135mm. Uh, the real belt is uh, square in cross section, about one millimeter in cross section, and it's about seventy-five millimeters folded length. Based on my refurbishment of four two fours Mark two and three that have a similar transport, you can get away with sourcing this one from a generic multi pack and get 
multi packs and assorted cassette belts for a few pounds in UK money. This one I would buy a, a decent neoprene belt from a manufacturer. I use GB Audio in the UK. Okay, so moving on to further deconstruct this. Um, let's try and get this as, as detached as we can. Here's our is that the pitch control? I myself, I haven't actually used this. I'm taking it apart without ever having even trying to t even try to turn it on. But yeah, that's the pitch control, so we can detach that. From this board here, a lot of trim pots there. This is the control, the control PCB. So maybe those are fine tuning controls for how far the heads retract and lower. Probably not something you're going to need to deal with. But something that you might need to do, you might have unresponsive buttons, so we need to get this off. See this thing that's basically a pin going through a splaying part. So if you push pin in the centre, then it'll come out enough on this side. If you push the pin through, then this part that I'm pinching closes enough to allow it to pull out from the front. So we've got two of those, one on each side. Push the pin in the centre of that one. That makes a little space where I can get the pin out from the front. Then push back on these three clips. Yeah, and then that slots out of there. So if any of these buttons were unresponsive, then we could um, pull a little bit of contact cleaner through them. You can see that one of those buttons is already a little bit broken. So the way this is, that's not going to be quite so easy to repair but I can probably get into that little break there. A little bit of JB weld maybe, maybe a little tiny dab of uh, friction welding so that, that doesn't become any worse. Right, so those ribbon wires that's soldered in. We, we can see that there are two screws that are holding these two together imagining that you wanted to get in and do any soldering to this board here but I mean for most people myself included that's going to be beyond your ken. If you start having problems with the screen then you need to replace this whole part you're not going to really be able to repair it so we'll leave that there. Let's get this detached from this board. I'm cutting this little cable tie here because it's tying together cables that are obviously soldered in at this end but then some of the ones in this clump are detachable. I'm going to go ahead and cut these and try and put this back into a sort of slinky wire later on. Think hard before you cut these yourself. If whatever you're doing to repair yours can be done without cutting these cable ties, then I would advise you to do that. These two hedges that have a red wire coming from them, they're soldered into the board there. All the rest um, disconnect at this end and terminate in this area here. Let's get this board up. Got two screws. Looks like we've got two common ground connectors joining here. One's coming from this bit of shielding and the other is probably more shielding under there, we'll see in a minute. So I'm beginning to get the impression that this isn't going to be fun to put back together again. Okay, so this board with all the input jacks then goes off, joined by ribbon cables. Let's be complete and take this little pitch control board out here. And I can confirm by the way that that common ground cable that was going to the jack socket daughter board is attached to shielding from underneath this board here. See the location of the screws, it looks like we've got three a little black one in the middle and red ones in the, those two corners. Black one's very short, wide ferrule. Red one's also very short. They've got this sort of double domed top. Looks like something else is holding it in. Let me go off screen a minute and figure this out. Okay, the only other thing that was holding it in place was just this block of rubber um, which sort of stuck to a post here. So I guess when you put that back in, tip it in towards the uh, power input and the power switch, making sure that this post goes through this recess and then you could replace that bit of rubber there. Maybe use double-sided tape or something to attach it. Uh, right, that wasn't much fun to take apart to be honest. Um, not the most efficient design for the service engineer. I'm kind of complimenting myself, really calling myself a service engineer, but you know what I mean. I'm looking for the trim pots for calibration. 
but they're not labelled in a very sensible way. Like some of these PCBs, it'll say which trim pop does which. Um, uh, if you're going to calibrate this, you would really need to have the service manual or do some experimentation. Listen to something through track one and turn all three of them till you figure out which is the playback level. And it's going to be the same trim pot in this little constellation of three trim pots in each time. That's not great news. So there we go. Not liking what I'm seeing very much based on the uh, deconstruction of it, but. I I will clean it, reassemble it, and test it. If there are electrical problems, then I will document those and they'll end up on the channel at some point. Once it's working, I'll maybe try and record some music with it, do a bit more of a review and summary of it. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope to see you again soon.